You know, our allies are asking a very pertinent question. Is President Obama trustworthy in an international crisis? Many American allies are saying we're just not sure after his weak responses in Ukraine and Syria. Now the president's on a tour of four countries in Asia trying to shore up American credibility there. Mark Martin has the story. Asian countries like Japan are nervous the U.S. won't defend them if China tries to take some disputed islands by force. President Obama reassured Japanese leaders the U.S. will stand by them if their territory is threatened. And let me reiterate that our treaty commitment to Japan's security is absolute. And Article 5 covers all territories under Japan's administration, including the Senkaku Islands. However, the president says the U.S. will not draw a red line over military action. Asian allies are concerned because they've watched Obama talk tough in Ukraine and Syria, but do very little. The president added to the rhetoric, saying new sanctions against Russia are in the works, but they need the support of other countries. We have been preparing for the prospect that we're going to have to engage in further sanctions. Uh, those are teed up. Um, it requires some technical work, and it also requires coordination with other countries. I think he has made a decision. He will not have a military conflict if he can at all, at all help it. And he's dealing with someone that knows that and is willing to push as far as he needs to to get everything he wants. And so far, Vladimir Putin is getting every single thing he wants. Senator John McCain accuses President Obama of being weak on foreign policy, saying it is disgraceful and the rhetoric does not match the action. One complaint involves Syria, where the president promised military action, then pulled back at the last minute. Certainly the, um, the issue of Syria really got to both Tokyo and Seoul because President Obama announced that he wanted to use military force, but that he first had to go to get congressional approval. And, and that led many people in the region with defense treaties with the United States wondering whether um, if China attacked them, President Obama would have to go to Congress in order to honor our defense treaties. Concerns which seem justified, considering China is building up its military and pushing for more control in Asia while the U.S. makes defense cuts. Mark Martin, CBN News. You know, ladies and gentlemen, nobody wants a war. You'd be insane to want a war. War is awful. And, and the people who are the strongest against wars are those generals who've been in them. They see the cost of blood and treasure, and they don't want to get involved. But at the same time, the good ones realize that the best way to avoid war is to be sufficiently strong so that some person doesn't try an adventure against you. And to pre present an atmosphere of weakness is terrible. You've got a president that says, well, we're going to study the possibility of having sanctions. I mean, come off it. You know, what, what kind of a message? And you send a few hundred troops into Poland uh, that would be wiped out in a second if some uh, if the Russians decided they wanted to do something against Poland. I mean, the, we are the strongest nation on earth, but we're not acting that way. I mean, we, we, we're, we're the one that, that is supposed to vouchsafe for the security of the rest of the free world. And they're depending on us. The Ukrainians signed a treaty with us, gave up their nuclear weapons. And what have we done? We've let Putin dismember the country, or at least start to, and have done nothing. Same thing in Syria. We had a red line. If he uses uh, chemical weapons, well, he used chemical weapons. We did nothing. And who knows, 100,000 or more Syrians have been butchered by that uh, Assad regime. What have we done? Nothing. So our allies are saying America is no longer reliable. And that's not a good thing because we need a coalition of people who count on us and agree with us and uh, know that we've got their back, as we say. But we don't have anybody's back now. Well, we're in Afghanistan. I felt it's a mistake to be over there. It didn't work for uh, some of the great conquerors. Uh, of antiquity, it isn't going to work for us either. And uh, that's been a hot spot for President uh, Obama. Uh, but today, more Americans have been killed in Afghanistan. And this time, the attack came in a Christian medical network. John Jessup has that story from Washington. 
Pat, three American doctors were killed by an Afghan security guard who opened fire at a hospital in Kabul. The shooting took place at Cure International, a Christian network of charitable hospitals and surgical programs. Its motto is curing the sick and proclaiming the kingdom of God. Two of the dead Americans were a father and a son, and the third was a Cure International doctor who had worked for seven years in Kabul. He was a child specialist. The attacker was a member of the Afghan Police Protection Force assigned to guard the hospital. The gunman was wounded and taken into custody. No word yet of a motive. The United States and Israel are condemning a surprising announcement from the Palestinians. The two main political groups, Fatah and Hamas, have announced they will reconcile and form a unity government within a matter of weeks. But the U.S. says it will be hard for Israel to negotiate with a new government that doesn't recognize its right to exist. Chris Mitchell has a story from Jerusalem. Hamas Prime Minister Ismail Haniyeh announced the end of a seven-year feud with Fatah. We declare this good news, the end of the years of the division of our Palestinian people in their homeland and in the diaspora. President Abbas will now begin consultations on forming an interim government within five weeks. The announcement marked the possible end of a bitter struggle between the two groups. Hamas overthrew Fatah in a brutal takeover of the Gaza Strip in 2007. Since then, Gaza has been under the grip of Hamas. Many Palestinians welcomed the agreement. While many Palestinians cheered the deal, here in Israel, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas had to choose his peace partner, either Israel or Hamas, which the U.S. considers a terrorist organization. We're trying uh, to uh, relaunch the negotiations with the Palestinians. Every time we get to that point, Abu Mazen stacks on additional conditions, which he knows that Israel cannot give. So instead of uh, moving into peace with Israel, he's moving into peace with Hamas. And he has to choose. Does he want peace with Hamas or peace with Israel? You can have one, but not the other. Egypt's Muslim Brotherhood birthed Hamas. Its charter calls for the destruction of Israel and the formation of an Islamic caliphate or empire in its place. The agreement seriously complicates negotiations between Israel and the Palestinians and creates a dilemma for U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry. The State Department called the announcement disappointing and troubling. It's hard to see how, uh, how Israel can be expected to negotiate with a government that does not believe in its right to exist. The State Department said Hamas would need to renounce terrorism, recognize Israel's right to exist, and accept previous Israeli-Palestinian agreements. Kerry hoped the two sides would continue negotiations beyond his April 29 deadline, a deadline now in jeopardy. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Pat, you've said all along those talks wouldn't go anywhere. They won't, and we're wasting so much time and energy, and you've got uh, shuttle diplomacy with the Secretary of State flying back and forth. Look, it isn't going to happen. And the sooner we get to reality, the better it'll be. There's no such thing as a Palestinian state. This two-state solution is a chimera. It's just not going to happen. We should say the West Bank belongs to Israel as the historic homeland of the Jewish people. And uh, uh, the Palestinians that are there could either uh, accept a, a citizenship in Jordan or they can uh, fold into Israel and be citizens of Israel if Israel will have them. The whole so-called right of return isn't going to happen. Israel is not going to allow generations of Palestinians to flood into their country and therefore overwhelm the demographic balance. It's not going to happen. And so all we're doing is asking for trouble and a lot of heartache and a lot of uh, foolishness. And the United States should just say, look, we recognize Israel has now taken the West Bank and they should uh, govern the West Bank and they should set up just and, and righteous laws in the West Bank. And if the West Bank citizens want to have citizenship other than Israel, Jordan is their natural home. And that's, we just do that. And stop this nonsense. But we, we, we're caught up in this fiction that somehow the, there's going to be a perfect world and we're going to divide Jerusalem and we're going to break the promises of God and we're going to go against the Word of God and it not doesn't ever work. John. Pat, the World Cup soccer matches in Brazil start in June, but one of the top issues is what's happening off the field, sex trafficking. 
There's concern sex tourists will abuse thousands of young children literally in the shadows of the stadiums. But as Heather Sells reports, Operation Blessing is working to fight this abuse with a new documentary. Brazil hopes to attract more than half a million fans for this summer's World Cup and take in billions of tourism dollars. Unfortunately, sex traffickers hope that an already profitable market there will prove even more lucrative this year. Their perverse business model links world-class soccer with child sexual exploitation. You can go online and, and see like $12,000, $10,000 for the flight, the hotel, the game, and the girl. Many believe that showing tourists and Brazilians the dangers of child trafficking is the best way to fight it before the World Cup. That's the idea behind a documentary that Operation Blessing is releasing next month. We're trying to raise the stigma against this and educate the, the, the people coming in for the World Cup that this isn't just a service you can buy without consequences, that these are, these are children trapped in, in a hell. To raise that stigma, the filmmakers hope to reach families. Thanks to a hyper-sexualized culture, views on sexuality have become warped. We see kids talking at 12, 11, that uh, if you haven't lose your virginity when you're 12 or 11, something's wrong with you. I see many, many cases of uh, mothers being, like, selling their daughters na to neighbors, you know, on the streets, taking them to the street, teaching them kind of the business to survive. Traverso says this twisted mindset combined with poverty created the perfect storm in Brazil, which now carries an international reputation for child sex trafficking. Look at the problem, you know, over 500,000 children in prostitution. Some reports say over a million children in prostitution. Operation Blessing hopes to air its documentary on Brazilian national television and will also produce a short video for airlines bringing World Cup fans to the games. It's also working with other ministries to directly reach fans at the venues and speak out against the tragedy of trafficking. Heather Sell, CBN News. The, etern uh, the Attorney General of the United Kingdom says atheists who claim Britain is no longer a Christian nation are, quote, deluding themselves. Dominic Grieve tells the London Telegraph newspaper, atheists must accept the that faith shaped Britain's laws and ethics and that 1,500 years of Christian values won't disappear overnight. But he says some people don't want to express their beliefs because of deep intolerance from religious extremists of all faiths, including Islam and Christianity. Pat? Well, I salute the Attorney General of Great Britain for his bold statement. I wish we could have some more of that here in the United States. This nonsense about uh, separation of church and state has gotten way, way beyond the bounds of what the founders of our Constitution thought. There's a case called Zorak versus Clawson that was decided some years ago. Justice Douglas wrote the majority opinion on that. And in that decision, he said, quote, we are a religious people whose institutions presuppose the existence of a supreme being. It's time we put that in big, bold caps all over the place and say, that's where we are. And I appreciate the Brits, and it's, I wish some of the other people in Europe would follow British, Britain's example and say, we were founded uh, in, with Christian principles. We've got the cross on our flag and things like that. We, we've got to do that because we're under assault by militant Islamists, militant atheists, secularists, those who want to destroy all the fabric of faith in our society and the great freedoms we have found on our belief in God. Uh, because we believe in God, we also believe in, in human rights. We believe in freedom. And our freedom comes from Him. John? Pat, in Nigeria, Christians in the Muslim North have been the targets of relentless deadly attacks by Islamic terrorists. More than 200 pastors in the northeastern Borno state have either fled closed their churches or been murdered by the Islamic terrorist group Boko Haram. Christian leaders who remain are fasting and praying for the region for an entire week each month. Christian Today Media Group from the UK reports that one Nigerian pastor told Open Doors, we have to stay and uphold the name of Christ in this state. And he said, we are willing to pay the price for our calling. We don't only share the gospel when things are rosy, swords and guns, even the roar of the devil, will only encourage us to stand first for Christ. 
And Pat, clearly we need to pray for the persecuted church for boldness and protection to fight the good fight of faith. I tell you, they shame us, John. They, they shame us. These people are so courageous. You, you know, there was an Indian uh, man uh, who was a Christian who was facing persecution and, and killing. And uh, he wrote a hymn that is very familiar, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. And uh, he was willing to sacrifice his life because he had found the Lord. And I, I, those of us in American Christianity are so used to such comfort, uh, such ease, such, uh, you know, material uh, splendor that uh, we, under, we don't uh, operate under that same point of view. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but the truth is we're under assault by militant Islam. And the trouble is that the elites in our society, the, the opinion makers, are undermining our fight. They're taking away our weapons because they refuse to let us to name what it is. And they call it political correctness. They say, well, we just cannot be intolerant of Islamic people. Their faith is as good as you as anybody else's faith, and they're entitled to express their views. They're entitled to have their call to, uh, to worship out of their mosques. They're entitled to do this and do that and do the other. And uh, then we say the brother, Muslim Brotherhood sounds so benign. Truth is, it's a terrorist organization. It founded the Palestine Liberation Organization. It founded Hamas. It's founded many others. And its goal is world domination. But uh, our political correctness doesn't let us say that. So actually, there are people representing the mother, Muslim Brotherhood who are in the highest councils of the security apparatus of the United States of America, advising our leaders as to how to deal with terrorism. Nonsense. I want you to be informed. You know, the best thing we can do is have an informed citizenry. Um, this book is just fantastic. It's called Islam, A Religion of Hate or Peace. And uh, it's available. We'll give it to you. And thousands of people have asked for it. And if somebody wants it for their churches or religious organizations, uh, we'll be a slight charge, but you, you can get hundreds of copies if you so desire. But it's 1-800-759-0700. Islam. Is it a religion of peace or war? What is it? Okay. The Alabama Supreme Court has handed down its second decision declaring the word child includes both the born and the unborn. The ruling earlier this week follows the appeal of the conviction of a woman who used cocaine during her pregnancy. Her baby tested positive for the drug at his birth. Under Alabama law, that's considered chemical endangerment of a child. The court ruled the state has a legitimate interest in protecting the life of children from the earliest stages of their development. Alabama Chief Justice Roy Moore and Justice Tom Parker wrote in the court's opinion, God, not governments and legislatures, gives persons these inherent natural rights. The American Center for Law and Justice has filed a lawsuit on behalf of a Maryland man who says he was denied admission to a college for his faith. Brandon Jenkins says the Community College of Baltimore County told him, quote, he wore his religious beliefs on his sleeve. Jenkins was otherwise qualified for the school's radiation therapy program. The ACLJ filed a federal lawsuit on his behalf. It said belief in God does not and should not disqualify a student from admission to college and the university's blatant and explicit discrimination is intolerable. And you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at cbnnews.com.